Okay, welcome back. Teeth K9. Uh, tonight I'm going to go over the things that judges look for when you're trialing. It's not going to be, um, there aren't going to be lessons on how to do things or how not to do things. Uh, this particular presentation will be just what it is we actually look for when we're uh, judging a trial. Uh, sometimes you wonder why we put these little ticks on the paper. If you look at the score sheets, when you usually get a copy of it, or when it's being explained to you later on, it'll have different ticks in certain areas, and it's just to give us an idea of uh, for scoring, let's say. If everything was perfect, it'd be great. Everybody, We think everybody should uh, pass and win. But because we're scoring you doesn't mean we don't think you're good at what you're doing or the dog isn't good at it. We're scoring the things that you could improve on. So it's not a bad thing. It's not looked on on our part anyway. It's not looked on as being a negative thing. Uh, we look at the different things and compare it to if you were out working, if you had a, uh, an agency dog and you're out working narcotics, explosives, whatever, uh, you would be judged by your handler, your, your instructor. So the instructor is going to tell you how you can do it better. So what not to do, what to do, uh, things that could improve your performance. So they're being told it verbally. All we're doing is we're putting it on pieces of paper and putting in little check marks. So all it is is uh, it's a piece of paper saying on this day, at this time, this is what you did. It doesn't mean you couldn't do it yesterday. It doesn't mean you can't do it tomorrow. But we have to take a little picture in time and say on this day at this time this is what you did and this is what your how your dog performed so I've, I've picked out some things here uh, hopefully we can cover them a little better the thing that I'm also going to try to get you guys to do is on the YouTube that you're seeing this on uh, subscribe please at the bottom and you can hit the little bell I believe there's a bell at least I've seen them on everybody else's uh, that what that does is it lets you know every time I put up a, a new video so I'll be putting out different series of uh, videos over uh, over the next, say, couple months or few months. It's going to uh, cover, or they will cover, uh, how-tos. And I'll, I'll tell you right up front, it's, in some cases, it's my opinion. It doesn't mean that whoever's uh, teaching you doesn't have a different uh, opinion or a different way of doing it. That's fine. There's all kinds of different ways. Don't let anybody ever tell you it's got to be this cast in stone. It's not like that. Uh, if I tell you to go from wherever you're at, uh, say we're near Halifax or just outside Halifax, I want you to go downtown by the harbor. There's two or three different ways you can get there. Which one's right? It all they all take you there. So again, it's just the finished product that. Um, really matters in the long run but what the score sheets do is they'll help you to focus on certain things for the next trial so when you step up to the line uh, number one willingness of the dog to work believe it or not some dogs would rather do something else and you have to understand that there are different types of dogs out there some sight hounds uh, we do look at each dog and take that into consideration some dogs just aren't, um, they have certain habits. So we try to take that in consideration. That's why when we look at a judge or becoming a judge, we try to see your overall experience on um, working with different types of dogs. So you have that understanding. There are some basic concepts that go right across all the breeds. And then there are some things that are kind of specific or, or more towards certain breeds. So. Uh, willingness to work, big. It's a it's a big one there. Lack of focus. Does the dog start and then wander off? Oh look, there's a butterfly. Or oh, there was something here, maybe yesterday, a day before. There could have been It could be an exterior search. So you have tons of of scents out there. Uh, little Johnny could have had a peanut butter sandwich there. You know, week before. You could have. There's anything. There's no such thing as a pure, pristine search area. It doesn't exist. Uh, so when we show up, we try to eliminate most of the distractions that we know are distractions. Uh, what we can't do is get rid of that scent that the dogs are so good at picking up on. 
Uh, so we don't know what was there before. We try to make it the, as realistic as we can. We do try to pull the, the, the uh, big distractions out or not use that area if there's something really too too distracting to the dog. It's not fair to you guys. Uh, handler has to keep trying to get the dog to search. Again, it's the same. It's that focus of the dog. It's that drive of the dog. Does the dog have it? Is he losing focus and wanders? Does he understand what's being asked of him? Uh, does he understand the search king, the hunt king? Uh, that shows up more in the lower levels, like start at levels and into, say, the advanced levels. Sometimes we see it a little further. But it's, uh, is the dog willing to work? Does it want to work? In other words, um, if you get out there and the only person really working was you, then we have to score the dog off on certain points there. And that's sometimes, a lot of times, it's a, a training issue. Um, we didn't, maybe we didn't make it exciting enough for the dog. Uh, again, I'm not going to go into the training end of it. Uh, I will look at um, a few different points as we go along here, but... It, uh, I'm going to stay out of the training area for now. Uh, that will follow up. Pursuit of target odor. Again, it's coming around. Does the dog have that hunt drive? Okay, where is it? I got to find it. It'd be no different than having a lot of brush and bush and high high grass around. And I take that ball or something and I throw it off and it's gone. You can't see it. How long will the dog work before it gives up and just walks away? So is that drive in the dog, is that hunt drive, that, that desire to search, is it in the dog? So we look at that. Sometimes it's just because um, yeah, yeah, I'd rather do something, I'm tired today, or you've been waiting all day. We try to take into consideration, you showed up first thing in the morning, you aren't up on, you know, your turn is not up till maybe well after lunch, maybe mid-afternoon. The dog's tired, could be hot. We try to take all that in consideration. The dog is hot. Um, maybe it needed a drink. You know, we try to go over a few things. First thing you do when you go out uh, is make sure your dog is hydrated. You have to keep that dog's nose, you know, moist. You have to keep the olfactory senses operating so that uh, chamber in there is is moist. So, if you ever seen a dog lick a rock, for instance, what it's doing is it's activating the scent with the moisture. So it needs moisture to activate scents. So as the dog starts to get thirsty. Is it panting more and it's not um, using its nose as much as it would if it was hydrated? So that's not something we score. That's something uh, that we just we do pass along as we're starting off. Just a, a little bit of a, a, a tidbit there to work with. Start it. Does the dog recognize the odor? In the start it level, uh, you know, is it going to stop? It goes right across the scent and it didn't do anything. Does it recognize it? Uh, it sounds simple, it sounds crazy, but sometimes the dogs, uh, they know it's there, but they don't recognize it as, this is what I'm going for. Yeah, there's a scent there, but again, that desire to find that scent, recognition of odor, uh, is that there? Or are they too busy doing other things that doesn't mean enough to them? So that's, we look at that. Dog not taking directions from the handler. That is uh, a big one. Dog's going <laughs> one way, handler's going the other way, and there's no communication going back and forth here. The line gets tight, you know, and you're pulling the dog over here. My, meanwhile, you're looking over here as you're pulling the dog, and the dog just uh, stopped and looked at the exact spot that uh, the set was there. Mm -hmm. So you're pulling the dog over here to where you want to go, and meanwhile, the dog wants to go somewhere else. So you know, where's the uh, partnership there? Are you working together as a team? We like to see them work together so that it's, 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 a, it's a nice match. You can tell they're working, they're paying attention to each other. I'm letting the dog work and the dog is allowing me to suggest, all right, we need to cover this area over here. Uh, we're gonna miss it if we walk by, so I need to send you in there. Uh, that will uh, cover that here in a second about uh, search strategy. But is the dog working with you? So we, that's one thing we do look at. Uh, again, the dog's not taking directions from handler is something that uh, it, it's, it's not nice to see. When we're there, we're judging, we know you both have an idea in your minds and you're both working separately. And it'd be so much easier if you work together. 
Uh, does the dog, uh, does the handler understand the dog's behavior? And that goes back to, can they read their dog? Is there a difference between, for instance, there's a bit of a distraction. We know there's a distraction out there. It could have been a crack on the sidewalk. It could have been the uh, school desk. It could be anything. So the way I usually look at it is the dog is allowed to uh, investigate just not indicate. So if you're pulling the dog off and not allowing it to check things out, uh, being able to read the difference in a dog just checking something out so they can eliminate it from the whole picture and a dog going to scent. When we when we talk about that, uh, I, I never pull the dog away because the dog has to take the overall picture of everything that's in that room and the dog has to take it all in so okay now it's all part of the accepted scent here but I'm still looking for that odor I'm still looking for that scent so it you see it working on the dog's mind and say okay fine that's there that's there okay great but it's not what I'm looking for so again usually what happens is uh, the handle pulls the dog off or tells them to come with them yet um, you know the dog's still not finished trying to check an area out uh, in a case like that, if the dog, if the handler is pulling the dog off, it's the handler that gets penalized as far as um, a point deduction on it. Uh, slow to call. Slow to call means they watch their dog, aim it up, it indicate it, and they're stalling. They're just waiting. They're watching. And you know it's nerves. But they're waiting. The dog has already given them a full-blown indication. We can see that. Uh, it's it's very clear that the dog is on scent and they stall and wait and wait. And they kind of look around and eventually they kind of put their arm up and say, um, alert? That's going to lead you to problems down the road. You know, you're slow to call Eventually, that's going to lead to some problems with uh, if you don't want. Uh, okay, I'm telling mom. I'm telling you this is here, and you aren't interested. It, it sometimes the dogs know better uh, than we do when it comes around to. Uh, oh, I know how to play this game. Just watch me, mom. Uh, and I'll give you a good example of that. I was judging uh, an exterior of vehicles, and it was it was a border collie, and the poor dog uh, went up put its nose right on it, froze, looked up at its owner, froze, and I don't know how many times it did this. Finally, the dog looked up at the handler, who was not paying attention to the dog and believing it. The dog left the site, came up to me, and indicated to me and wanted to bring me in to say, it's there. She doesn't know this, but she's not listening to me. It's right there. And it was hilarious because this dog started indicating working for me instead. So, again, slow to read the dogs, slow to make a call on it. Pulling the dog off odor. So the dog is attempting to investigate, it's processing it, and you turn and go the other way and you pull the dog off. The dog's just waiting, maybe it was a little slow getting into its indication, maybe it's just wanting to, wanting to confirm that, yep, this is it, and you pull the dog off. So, you know, again, the dog is trying to investigate to make sure it has the right uh, signal to you and suddenly you pull it off. Now it says right here not wa not watching the dog. It's it's pretty common we see that a lot of times this is just because you've got a case of the nerves you're nervous. Uh, in the in the uh, beginning levels we see it a lot and we expect that and we, we we compensate for that in our in our scoring and you know you come in the door at a start at level and basically if you can stand up and walk and the dog can walk around we're going to give you you know kudos we're going to give you bonuses just for going in and attempting it and finding the scent that that's a bonus so it's uh it's a case of the nerves uh, no one likes people watching them a lot of people don't like being judged it's uh, so we try to stay away from being the big bad guy saying oh you did this this and this wrong so leash handling that's a big one uh, tripping over the leash uh, interfering with the dog uh, maybe steering the dog putting it over here uh, for instance uh, you'll see the leash coming tight like this there's a difference between when the dog pulls the loose uh, the leash tight and it becomes taut 
as you start to move around and you pulling the leash and usually you'll see the hand come up and it's pulling tight on the dog because they don't want the dog to wander around because they want them to work on a very specific spot that's steering the dog okay you see it in vehicles sometimes you see the body blocks all these different things so you they you aren't allowing the dog to actually work you are are physically putting the dog in the different spots so we do watch for that uh, sometimes it's it's uh, again it's very normal at the start at levels but as you proceed through the different levels uh, the dog should be working on its own so we do score differently for instance at the start at level as opposed to the elite or excellent levels you have experienced by then so we expect a little higher performance out of you handler soliciting soliciting alert from canine that's when they're pretty sure that the dog is on the scent but uh, they're no no check it no is it there is it that show me huh show me and they're going on and they want the dog to do a specific um, action so they're so scared of the dog not doing that and they're going to lose they're going to fail your indication is one point we would rather see your ability to read the dog because I know everybody trains to a trained behavior and when it comes around to uh, indications but I've worked dogs for a lot of years and I've seen the dog go into a totally different um, action if you want to call it but I knew it was not ordinary for the dog so it was out of ordinary behavior for that dog so can you read your dog when it's trying to tell you something it went into uh, a different type of alert it could be 80 90 degrees out and you're waiting all day the dog's tired it may not be as as enthusiastic uh, as it would be if it was first thing in the morning when it was nice and cool out when you started so we aren't worried about the indication as much as we are the ability of the handler to read their dog so don't worry about the indications uh, we can you can work on that later on and it's already a point okay it's not a pass or fail at all if uh, I've seen some sheets so that I think if they put down look at handler nose on source freeze I think they list just about everything the other thing they don't list is breathing at that point so we know it's a little uh, it's a little touchy with some people they haven't finished working on that particular item with their dogs so uh, we will uh, look at this and we just want to see can you read your dog Distractions, kids, dogs, uh, anything. They hear a noise, a plane, birds. Uh, it could be, I've seen it where you get a little butterfly or a bug that goes over here. Oh, I'd rather go look at that. Okay, so the importance of the finding the, the, the scent is not high enough with the dog to make that dog ignore the distraction and do its job. So we look at that as far as distractions. Does the dog maintain its focus? The um, hardest thing a lot of time is doing exterior searches. When you're doing exterior searches, we don't know who's been there. We don't know how many neighbors have come along with the dogs and the dogs peed on this spot over there or, or what have you. And we know it's there. We can't help that. But that's, that's life. In a perfect situation, it'd be sterile. But we don't have that. So is the dog willing? Again, it goes back to the focus on the dog, the willingness, the drive to get to scent. We look at that. Is how much of a distraction um, did it take to actually get that dog off its job? Sometimes it's minor. Sometimes it's a major one. And if it's a major one, we take that into consideration saying, okay, yeah, my dog would have done the same thing. Now let's get back to work. So it's, uh, it's something that we look at. <laughs> Okay, so that brings us to search sequence and search patterns. Uh, what we find is when people go in, they don't have a, a pre-planned setup, so they wander around. There's a, there's a way of looking at an area, and we take you through the walkthrough. That's what we want you to do, is have a look at it and decide where the hard areas are, where the areas are that you need to get the dog into. Uh, because dogs will naturally, a lot, a lot of times, will bypass a corner. Uh, so they zip through and you go around. You end up going back uh, to the same spot many times. 
because you didn't have a, a firm system in place. So you're missing areas. Um, a lot of people will start, it's a random one. They say, oh, I just wanted to watch the dog. The dog was doing its search. So the dog wasn't doing its search. The dog was wandering around. So the dog didn't uh, have full intentions of seeking the scent, let's say, seeking the uh, the goal of finding that scent. It, it, it did, um, but it had no structure to how it worked. That's what you're there for, is to help the dog. So we look at the partnership working there. Uh, a lot of times we know you you kind of forgot where you're at when you go back to the same uh, same hide. Uh, alert, did I find this one before? So you, they don't remember where they've been. So you work your plan. Uh, you plan your work and work your plan. Uh, I call it go uh, by the numbers. So I look at the area. I said, okay, I'm going to go this, 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 and this. And in that order. And I'm going to go in, clear the area, clean it, and go on. So you don't have to come back. Um, so many people just skip on little areas. I'll see them, in, for instance, on uh, on vehicle searches. They go around half the vehicle and then skip off to the front of the next one. And they kind of do a real random. Uh, we like to see that you have some kind of plan. Now, whatever plan it is, it's up to yourself. As long as we can recognize you did have a search strategy when you went in there. And some people have different uh, strategies, and we recognize that. So we're just looking, did you have an organized um, search strategy in mind when you went in there? Or did you just randomly walk around? Um, false indications. False indications. Um, we can tell a lot of times what you've been doing in your training up to the point of the, the trial. Uh, the dog goes along and says, this is it, looks up at the handler because they change their indications a lot of times. Instead of just their nose down, focused on it, they'll look back at the handler and say, this is it, and you call the alert. And Or you can turn around and say, no, and then the dog skips over to the next container or spot. Well, this is it, and looks at you. What happened is the dog stopped using its nose and started using its eyes. So what the dog was doing, it was looking at you for key points that you usually do when you come up to a known find. So that stands out to us. We can see that. So the dog really wasn't um, doing an independent search using its nose. It was relying on you because you do one little thing just prior to coming up to a known uh, hide. So that shows up. Uh, the dog looks for that as opposed to looking for the scent. So that's uh, that's something to to think about is watch yourself. Uh, scoring system, as we go up through the different levels of, say, start it through to elite, at each level we sharpen the pencil a little bit. We uh, start to sharpen our scoring. There are higher expectations of you at, say, an excellent level as opposed to a start level. And that's that just makes sense. Uh, people at the start level, they, they've just got into this. They're nervous. They go for their first uh, trial. They don't even know what to do. They've been out there by themselves. There's someone watching them. They're scoring them. They, uh, the dog is just new to it, uh, and they're out giving an honest try, but they just don't understand a lot of the different concepts of uh, uh, working a detection dog. They haven't got down pat yet, so they're nervous. They're learning a lot of new things. So when you get to excellent level, you've already gone through, started advanced. Advanced, you're wetting your feet a little bit more. You're starting to experience what a trial is really like. Okay, we sharpen it up a little bit. When you get to excellent, uh, excellent means that at one time that was our top uh, level. So we expect some performance out of you. When you go to elite, that means you should be at operational detection dog level. So we look for different things. And at that level, we aren't there to challenge the dog. Uh, that's what we do at the excellent level. When you get to elite level, maybe we're challenging the handlers a little bit too. How are you going to conduct the search? So now it's more of a challenge to you as opposed to the dog because the dog now has its its uh, routine down it knows what to do it uh, it's going to carry out whatever it is you ask it to do so we sharpened up a little bit uh, working stream and amateur stream that a few years ago uh, I was out and people were getting a little annoyed because I was sharpening my pencil if you had working line uh, working stream uh, picked out and they didn't understand why and basically all it was was a lack of understanding what the idea was of us putting out amateur and working amateur was just exactly what it says amateur you're new to this you're in 
Uh, you don't do this as a profession. You don't teach it. You don't uh, have any um, connection to working a detection dog at all. Working stream means you're more of a professional. Some people, they don't understand that. If they start teaching uh, scent work, they're considered a knowledgeable person uh, working with scent and working with scent dogs. So they had to be grouped in a separate uh, category. For instance, if I had a dog and I was going out and I was going to compete in a certain trial, uh, would it be fair I went up against the amateurs? No, because you'd have more, uh, well, higher expectations of, of myself as opposed to what they would of an amateur person. So it allowed the judges, instructors, uh, different people like that on a professional level, a chance to go in and compete in the sport, but more on their own level, their own scale. So that's what a working stream was. So when we judge that, we do sharpen up the pencil on the working level because we have higher expectations. So if you're going to be skipping back and forth amateur, and even, and I've seen some people stay at that same level and they go amateur, then working and amateur working. That's fine, but it's not just a duplicate of what you just did at the amateur. You're going to have more points taken off because we're sharpening the pencil a little bit. So that hopefully explains that a little. Um, just a little note, and I didn't say it at the very beginning, and I apologize for this. Uh, the reason why I put this, what judges look for, was of something that someone put out at a judges conference a couple years ago. Uh, and that was Pando Stepan uh, Stepanis. Uh, Pando's great guy. He put up a great slide presentation. We reviewed it again this year. And it just gave me an idea of, okay, maybe I'll put this. So I'm going to give him credit here. Uh, some of these subjects even were, were from him. So I stole it from you. Sorry, Pando. But uh, it was a great idea. So I'd like to share it with you. If you have questions, uh, uh, anything about our judging, send it to me. Again, I'm going to tell you that on the YouTube site there, click uh, subscribe to it and the little bell down the bottom saying uh, you want to be notified when I put out new uh, videos. I will be putting out videos uh, on a fairly regular basis. I'm also working on some other presentations for agencies and that's so I'm squeezing this in between. I want to give it all the attention that you're looking for so if you have questions about training that's our, my next topic is going to be training, uh, training problems and questions. Uh, put it down on the, on the uh, YouTube if you want but uh, better still send an email to me dteft at eastlink.ca or send me a, a Facebook note. I have quite a list of questions now. I've gathered some people have been sending some stuff in and I will take one subject, one area at a time and when I do a presentation it will just be about that one area and we'll go over some training things that I find uh, help you know dogs or myself in the past. I can tell you I've, there's nothing you can do that I haven't done wrong at least twice. All right, I think that's how you learn is by making mistakes so you know what not to do. Uh, just a little bit of a, if I could throw something in here before we go to the training uh, side of it. If you kept a log, a training log, uh, I love training logs because I can go back to see did I make this mistake before and what happened when I changed this, this or this, A, B or C. Did it improve or did it go backwards. So a little bit of a training log, just a little note to yourself will help you in your training because you can go back and say, oh yeah, it was this time, this time, this time. Anybody that uh, uh, runs a detection dog, I, uh, I strongly uh, recommend, matter of fact, I, I require it uh, when I'm working with uh, some teams that you have a training log because of different legalities, problems, whatnot, we can go back and fix a mistake. We know you addressed this before, the dog had a slump. In a case like this where we're doing the, uh, the sport, it does the exact same thing. What happens is it will go back and show you that, oh right, this is what the dog did. Hmm. Were there other circumstances around that that uh, brought this problem out? And you can compare the two, it'll help advance. So hopefully you're enjoying this, I'll, uh, I'll do more. The uh, Again, uh, either send me the note or the email with questions about training. I have quite a long list of, of questions. Usually when I've been going across the country, I've been asking people to fill out cards uh, before I get there as to what their um, problems were that they're having. So because of that, I have quite an extensive list of, of questions. But believe it or not, the questions are pretty much the same from coast to coast. So you're all... Uh, very similar in how you work. We're, we're in this together. We're working a sport together. The training problems aren't unique, say, in BC as opposed to Nova Scotia 
or Newfoundland or Ontario. So uh, the more questions, the, the uh, better it's going to be for you guys. Again, if you have any questions, please uh, send a note to us or to myself. Uh, what I hope to do in the front and uh, the other end of it, of uh, these videos is throw in some other judges. I'll try to twist their arm so they can throw in some comments once in a while here because uh, a lot of times with the training part especially it could be just my opinion and as I said about say if I'm going downtown I tell you to go downtown and you take one route I take the other route which was right you, we both ended up at the same spot. So it's not that one's wrong and one's right, it's just a different approach. Some have had more success with one route as opposed to the other route. So I'm going to look for input from other judges as well, uh, possibly other instructors, so I can get a uh, unanimous, not necessarily unanimous, but a uh, the most common way of approaching certain problems that you've had. And I will try to throw in my end of it where I made mistakes, and I'll tell you where I've made mistakes, and it's, oh, yeah, right, I forgot to do that, and I've made a pile. Um, that's what makes a better handler down the road. The more mistakes you can make, um, the better you'll be at the end. Uh, one of my first dogs I had was an incredible dog. Uh, made me look good regardless of what I did, and I didn't know that much. I'll, I'll admit it, I it was a little green. But she made me look really, really good. It wasn't until I got the next dog, and maybe the next dog after that, or I was training with other dogs, that I discovered that, oh, I have training problems here. Well, I never had that before. So sometimes it's uh, nice just to get a few different opinions on that. So anyway, stay safe, everybody, and we'll see you in the next video.